ladies and gentlemen. Somebody, somebody. Everybody wants the prize, but nobody wants to pay the price. Can they be pushed? Do they have a sense of urgency? Do they want to be great? And then of course you look at them and be like, yeah, right. Everybody wants to be on your team when you're on top. I saw the angel and the marble and I carved until I set them free. Go be somebody, bro. But the most important part of the Be Somebody journey is the resilience. Welcome to the Be Somebody podcast, your real and raw destination for all things entrepreneurship, leadership, and culture. One of the top rated business podcasts in the world. Now give it up for your host, Be Somebody Inc. and BSB Group International founder and CEO, Cash Shake. Welcome to the Be Somebody podcast. You're still here, Herbie. We still got Herbie Pilata in the house. You invited me back for the, the Italian for the Stallion show. returns. It's like Rocky Three all over again, man. It's like dun, 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 I can't dun, dun, believe dun, dun, dun. you made it here, yeah. man. I need some gloves. I, I know you. Gloves. Hey, hey, you you've got the build. You've got the physique. That's all that matters. I'll take that know? as a compliment. I mean, I feel yeah. like the biceps are there, the triceps are there, everything necessary to the be a world class. The right? that, yeah, the, yeah. Well, you know, uh, we're okay. Almost. We, we're almost there, Herbie. We had such a great guest on last episode, uh, Andrea Diquez from Saatchi and Saatchi. And I was so inspired by that conversation, just from her personal story to her passion for everything that's happening in the world, her, her push for companies to, uh, to speak up and speak out like we've been talking about, right? This yeah. is a time for, for, for brand purpose, for values, for belief. And I, I love that conversation with Andrea. And, and I know we're going to continue it today with our next guest from Procter & Gamble, who I'm really excited to talk to. Most folks know who listen to the show. I used to work at P&G. I spent 10 years there. Um, amazing, amazing company. Largest consumer products company in the world. Uh, sell Charmin, sell Bounty, sell a lot of things, sell Pepto-Bismol. If for some reason <laughs> her, I get I get tired of staring at you, Herbie, and I get queasy. Just take a swig. You know, I take a swig, yeah. but uh, CPG, right? You think about CPG, and, and a lot of people don't know that the category is separated in edibles and non-edibles, right? So basically, things that you that you consume, right. Herbie. And I don't want to. I, I don't want to go down that dark place about you know everything that you're consuming and what you're thinking about when we talk edibles. about edibles. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why we got Vikas yeah. off the show yeah. because he was just going down into a deep dark place yeah. on that one. But I don't. <laughs> You know, it's broken down into edibles and non-edibles. And when you look at the data, according to IRI Worldwide, which is one of the, you know, the most respected industry monitoring data analytics uh, companies and Boston Consulting Group, BCG, there was a 20% increase in consumer spending on edibles compared to a year ago in the last month. Whereas consumer spending on non-edibles only grew about 7%. You know, so people... As we know and we all experienced, there was that uh, uptick, that hoarding, as some people say, of, of food, uh, of grocery and grocery stores were seeing the most growth across all the big kind of chain retail stores between uh, across all the, the mass market stores, convenience stores, groceries were peaking at 90% increase in consumer spending versus a year ago, just a month ago during that stockpiling phase. Yeah, I think uh, definitely a little guilty of that myself. So I, right. I, 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 you, I contributed to those numbers a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you, 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 your household <laughs> was about 80% of it. Yes, but yes. Non-edibles all saw a decline compared to a year ago. Um, that's cosmetics, that's uh, even OTC healthcare, even pet food. Of all the edibles and non-edibles, you know, so everything within the CPG category, frozen foods experienced the highest increase in consumer spending versus a year ago at 36%, which wow. is very interesting. If you remember in the early days of our podcast, episode four, we had Christine Day from Performance Kitchen, which really specializes in what they call fresh frozen, which is basically the science of freezing food at the height of its nutritional value and capturing the nutritional content within that food so that even though you're sticking it in your freezer and you're buying it from the freezer, it's still really healthy for you. So I think that concept of fresh frozen is going to expand as a result of this pandemic. And then of course, we saw the uptick on general merchandise, paper products, home care, things like that versus a year ago because people were stockpiling toilet on, paper. On toilet paper and yeah. all that during the, during, during the pandemic, during that, that hoarding phase. And really, to me, one of the most lasting impacts of this is 
from a consumer habit change perspective of people's comfort level of buying groceries online, mm -hmm. leveraging uh, um, delivery platforms like the Instacarts, like the ships to, to, to get food. And I really believe that trend is, is here to stay and that's gonna continue to grow because we've all gotten comfortable with that process. So um, that's why I'm really excited about our guest today, man, because uh, I wanna get into how the business has been affected with not only the COVID-19 pandemic, which was obviously top of mind a few weeks ago, but also how's the company thinking about Black Lives Matter? How's the company thinking about the new mandate from consumers for big companies, big brands to have a point of view, to have a belief and to, to speak up on that belief and then put action behind it? You know, and we have one of the leaders on the innovation side uh, from Procter and Gamble, uh, and a mentor of mine from back in the day, my man Jerry Porter. He's going to be in studio next to me today, which I'm pumped up about, right? Because we haven't had yeah. many guests who've come in yet. No, this is my uh, my first in studio guest, and I believe this is our second in uh, in our in our two seasons here. Second time ever, yeah. and, and and Jerry's amazing. He's always been such an inspiring leader to me. Um, very down to earth very well traveled you know herbie he, jerry might be the only person who has more delta sky miles than i do we're gonna find out i mean i mean because seriously I, i've been blessed since 2003 you know i spent basically at least a day or two a week on the road with my various jobs and when we started this company i just wanted to get the hell away from you <laughs> so i was trying to get a plane as far as i could i would go to singapore yeah. i go you know seattle as quickly as possible just to get away from you herbie all right, now I understand. Well, you're not doing much traveling right now. So, I know, so uh, <laughs> now, now we're stuck, and that, that's why I wake yeah. up moody. I wake up very moody. But, you know, Jerry, I mean, he's lived on a plane forever, so I'd love to talk to him about um, how how the pandemic has affected his personal travel as well as business travel. And again, you know, as an African-American leader at a large public company, $80 billion company, how does he feel about everything that's that's going on in the world today? So it's going to be a great conversation that I'm so, uh, so pumped to have Jerry here in the studio. Awesome, Cash. Well, I'm super excited. Let's bring him on. Let's welcome a leader who graduated from Vanderbilt University with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. He started his career as an engineer at Procter & Gamble in 1987 and went on to have numerous director and VP roles. Now, after 33 years, he's the vice president of R&D Global Fabric Care at P&G from Cincinnati, Ohio. Please welcome Jerry Porter! Yeah! Hey, 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 how you doing, brother? How you doing, man? Great to see you. Man, we, Jerry, you're in studio. You're only our second guest ever in studio. Hey, man. You know what like I mean? It. I mean, I mean and, and Herbie, we've got Herbie here. He, it's his second second episode, right? Yeah, Herbie, second Herbie's one. second episode. Until I said, Herbie, we got a VIP coming in. Like, stay as far away as possible. We don't want you to interrupt the flow here. We may forget you're over there, Herbie. You know, I'm on the other side of the room. Don't mind me, guys. I know. I mean, try to pipe in if you need to, but otherwise just kind of like let me and Jerry do what we got to do. I'll over be over here, here if you know? need anything. Um, <laughs> but Jerry, man, thank you so much for being here. Hey, man, it's great to be here. Great to uh, actually uh, come in and see what you do, man. And uh, like I said, I'm, I've been so proud of the work and uh, it's been really fortunate. I had a chance to sort of mentor you, support you during the during these years. And like I said, the whole Be, Be Somebody franchise and the work you've done has just been, I mean, it's been heart lifting and, uh, and really uh, glad to be able to uh, participate and uh, hopefully drop some knowledge tonight with you, my friend. Yeah, man. Well, we got to get into your whole background and everything, but I got to tell the, the the team here and everybody listening that I remember when I was doing the travels with Be yeah. Somebody and we were going around painting murals and we were going around speaking at schools. I was I, pointing them out. It's like, Hey, you know, you see that up <laughs> yeah, there on the yeah, highway? Yeah, on 75. That side, on, 75. Like, uh, on 75 coming in downtown Cincinnati. And I remember I had a, a, a happy hour here in yep. Cincinnati. I invited some folks. And only and I'm like, let's see who shows up. And only a few people, a couple of people from Procter yep. & Gamble came. And you came. Actually, Jordan uh, here yeah. and Alex Fishman came who were in the room here yep. in the studio. But you came out, man. And I, yeah. remember, I, I always remember that. And I always appreciated that those little things you did to support the journey. Yeah, man. Well, listen, I mean, like I said, I mean, you're, you know, the writing, your thoughts, uh, the, the whole whole program was so inspiring, what you were trying to do. 
And so, yeah, I wanted to come out and support. And then, you know, you're just a, you're a great person, man. That's oh, why we've man, been, uh, been connected all these years and friends all this year. So I'm uh, excited to be here uh, to have this chat with you. Well, man, but, but, but how many Sky Miles do you have, Gary? <laughs> I, mean, so, I mean, tell me. I, I really want to know. Listen, Matt, is it you know via one airline or multiple? Well, How, I mean, what are you I, looking at? I mean, right, what, I, what's look, your criteria? I, I have three point one million miles on Delta. I'm a, I'm a three million miler on Delta, Jerry. All Come right. on, man, you, you got me beat on Delta, man. Okay, I've got, okay, got over go. a million yeah, on Delta. Delta. Yeah, I feel on Delta, okay. hey. but I have a half a million on Lufthansa. Oh, hey. oh, I got a couple hundred thousand on United. Oh man, you know, so I, I got mean, to tally the, them up. The, 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 the Lufthansa is wow. worth more. Damn it, Gary, you just came in. We're the presence of. Royalty. I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You got to come in with the German airline. <laughs> Deutschland. Yeah. Das ist gut. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Guten Tag. Guten, Guten Tag. Tag. Yeah. Uh, well, Jared, you know, we, we actually, uh, Kieran's in the room today for the first time hey, ever Kieran, in our studio. You, and Kieran and I actually went to uh, Berlin. Uh, awesome. A, a few, uh, I mean, it feels Great like city, years man. ago, Karen. Great I mean, it was city. a few months ago, right? Yeah, Checkpoint yeah. Charlie. Did you guys make it? We, we make it at oh, Checkpoint yeah. Charlie. We, we saw a lot of the sites there. We were working with one of our partners, international yep. partners there. But, you know, uh, that was such an awesome experience, I think, for, for our team. And, and, and Kieran, who's our head of culture here at, yep. at Be Somebody, we were talking to him, and he's a former Procter & Gamble um, uh, employee as well. We're we, we, in the house. Yeah, all yeah. right, all right, <laughs> yeah, represent. You know, we, we were talking about how amazing it was for us to experience the opportunity yep. to see the world uh, with P&G. No, like I said, I mean, that has been, you know, who would have thought, uh, you know, a country boy, as I like to say, uh, from East Tennessee would have had the experiences that I've had in all the different countries and, and locales. Grew up in uh, East Tennessee, always had a, an interest in uh, science and mathematics. Uh, went to a great school there. It was a great public school that even today really uh, strives on excellence and I keep in contact with a lot of the, the teachers uh, there today. Um, uh, Ms. Keeble, who, who taught uh, my math, and, and Dr. Uh, for Penny Ferguson, uh, an English. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, it was a great foundation. And then from there, I went to school at Vanderbilt um, in engineering. And like I said, it wasn't any magical uh, decision on how to pick engineering. I went to the library, looked at the book and said, OK, I like science. I like I like math. What's going to get me a job and what pays well? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Engineering. <laughs> right, 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 right. And so that said it. And like I said, it's been, uh, I've really enjoyed it. Oh, I did that too, Jerry. And then I looked at like the engineering coursework and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to stick to communication. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm like, let me go the safer route for me. You know what yeah, I mean? I mean, they try to you know, persuade you to like drop out. Is this really what you want to do <laughs> with some of those labs? But then from there, um, you know, I was able to, uh, you know, get in with uh, Procter Gamble and, uh, and a summer intern and, and started work in uh, Memphis in his division called uh, Buckeye Cellulose Pulp and Paper uh, work, uh, traveling down to Southern Florida in the Panhandle. And then, you know, I had numerous assignments. From there, I decided to do a, a gig where I was actually uh, doing uh, work in uh, Asia Pacific from the U.S. It was uh, called International Technology Coordination. So I was would work a month or so in the US and then I'd be gone for you know 3 to 4 weeks and I was in the middle of India in Manadeep doing uh, at the facility there doing uh, agglomeration trials or or in the Philippines you know in Manila right. you know working with the business there and or in Japan and then that really led to the first experience where I lived out of the country I uh, lived in Japan you know, only about a year but based in Japan completely different culture and a very very growthful time um, and uh, while I was actually setting up that uh, Asia Pacific group, um, you know, I even was uh, accused of being a Cecil Fielder at the time. Oh yeah, he was oh, being you got that. baseball at the time. I remember sitting at this, uh, you know, having a beer at uh, at this uh, locale there, this beer garden, and I remember this because ah, Cecil Fielder. <laughs> I'm like. No, I'm not. See, but, but it's a good conversation. I, I remember being in Manila and one of the bar and guys right south of the city and going in and someone and and I was tall and I was shooting because yeah. there was a basketball and there was a little hoop and then they were like Kobe Bryant, Kobe, Kobe Bryant. Bryant. I was, you know, and and Shaq. And, I was and, called Shaq. At see, the time. but 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 I but I played. I was like, yeah, I'm in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I play, I play ball. Yeah, for sure. I, I, you were honest about it, but I'm like, yeah, I'm an NBA player. Yeah, you know, play on the traveling team. 
<laughs> but, but but the vibe you always get in the in the Philippines, Manila, it's just it's a, a feeling of love, man. Everyone exactly. is so so embracing when you get there. Uh, and so I had always enjoyed my visits and, and the work in the Philippines. Just yep, the people, same, people same. just had a great heart, and uh, you know, and uh, and so it was a good time. You know, you recounting your journey being really so young in your career and being able to to travel the yep. world. Um, you know, that, that's such a, a, a huge opportunity. Yep. And, and, you know, that's the reason I went to Procter & Gamble. Yep. was like, I want to have a chance to work for a multinational company, a global company, and get a chance to see the world. They, it took me eight years of campaigning before they finally gave me a developing market job. Yep, yep. But, and it seemed like you got it quicker. Fifth year. Just a little you, bit you, quicker. You, you got five years. Five but, years in, man. <laughs> but but I, I, I really, for me, I was very um, blessed and grateful to be working in low-income markets yep. because i worked in some of, as you know in some of the poorest yes. countries in the world in the poorest communities the favelas in rio the barangays and the barrios and, uh, and the chile barrios, yeah. and argentina and some different places yeah and i think the thing though that was common is um folks are wanting wanted their kids to look the best right the the, the school uniform one of the best products to really because that was the pride and joy and and that's just sort of the that that translates uh, across the globe. You want the best for your kids and your family, and how you take care of them. And so, even in those uh, those constructs, uh, you know, that was a key need. That was a source of pride. That was taking care and showing the love for your family. And uh, and so, it's great that we had brands and products that could be there and and really meet their needs uh, where the consumers at. And so, that's been the journey and the joy of, of being at P and G of really. Sort of really bringing to life that that purpose, you know. Uh, times we we get in the conversation of, come on, you just make consumer goods, but when you really see how it intersects and interplays in the life of the consumer, it really does elevate um, just uh, the quality uh, the quality of the day and and what it really means to take care of your family. And so so it's great. So from that standpoint, I've really enjoyed um, the time, the thirty three years at P and G, the opportunities to live in. Japan and in Germany for for five years and, and well, I want to talk to you about Germany, but yeah. just thinking about what we talked about with the Philippines and in these low income yeah. markets, I remember and I know obviously um, we know, but maybe people don't know we work together on the Tide brand, Herbie, um, Jerry, and I, and and in the Philippines, I think uh, we were in Poland that time too, right? We're, Warsaw for the uh, one of the big global uh, global meetings. Yeah, yeah we, global we were in meetings. Poland. We were in Warsaw. We had some fun. We can't share yeah, all the details. Jerry, stop the talking details. right now, exactly, please. Uh, exactly. but my, my mother's That's listening. But, yeah, exactly. yeah, that was after. But but in the Philippines, what was so interesting? You know, one of the big consumer insights that I learned was that for a lot of the low income consumers, when they wash clothes, they use the bar. Yep. And and, bar and actually, time. yep, they would they would go to the well to get water. Uh, the moms would they'd come home and they would scrub the clothes. And what was interesting, whether you're in, in the Philippines, you're in Mexico, you're in uh, the Middle East, as you mentioned, the, 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 the bright white school uniform was a, a, a symbol of, of passion and pride and love and caring for your child. If you could send them to school with that perfectly uh, clean uniform, because they didn't have much to, to share and show that that love. These people didn't have a, a lot of money, didn't have a lot of things, and I always thought that was so powerful. Just like that was their way of showing showing their love. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and really elevating uh, the kids and the total family, and and the you know just really taking pride in what they had and uh, to make the most of it and uh, to live the day. And so yeah, so it. Like I said, it really taught me a lot also just about the, the human condition and just that we're all humans sort of striving uh, to live our best uh, in the world. And uh, along the way, you get to meet a lot of people. And so like you, I'm an extrovert, but I don't know that my uh, Rolodex has as many names in it as yours <laughs> does now. But yeah, you, you meet folks along the way um, that really sort of touch you, their stories. And so I always enjoyed that part and that aspect of travel is okay so you know who am i going to run in today to sort of learn a little bit about that i didn't know and, and that was th that's also an exciting piece uh, when we that's travel. really what started be somebody to be honest i mean yeah. I, when i was traveling that's when i started to to learn that base concept 
that really is more important today than ever, which is we're all more similar than we are different. Yep, definitely, man. Um, definitely. And, and and whether no matter your income status, your your race, your background, your culture, you're like, man, we all laugh and smile and cry at the same things and the same conversations. You'd walk into, you know, literally somewhere in the Middle East where you never thought you'd have a commonality and you and you'd have a conversation, and be like, man, we we're kind of we're we're vibing on the same level. Yeah, you know? exactly. You could find something. You can, you know, whether it could be sports. What food you like, whatever, uh, and uh, and and have a conversation. And uh, a lot of times, I would find folks just want to get to know who you are. I mean, especially if uh, you know, a big guy like myself traveling in. You know, how many home runs, Cecil? How many, yeah, home, how many home runs, <laughs> Cecil? Or or in the Philippines? You know, I go up to uh, you know at the Manila Hotel. I don't know if you ever remember that Peninsula? place. Peninsula. Which and one? The, uh, I was at the Manila, so an okay. old Manila. It was the place that MacArthur sort of uh, came into to announce. Mm. You know, I should return after he head out. It's a uh, you know, it's a very uh, uh, old and historic place, but you know, everything's all in white. So that I remember <laughs> very funny. I remember the, the guy at the door and he, and they call your taxi. We need a taxi over here. We need a taxi, we need a taxi. He's very proper. He has this white uniform on. He looks over, he goes, we need a one a larger taxi. <laughs> like, Do we I'm have alive. any minivans? Do we have any minivans for this uh, for this brother? But uh, but no. So no, there was much love in uh, in, in the Philippines and and really uh, enjoyed it. But I could tell you stories really just about every every place that I've traveled. My wife still reminds me of the time we lost my son in Murano. But, you know, there are, there are lots of memories that we had uh, during that time frame. She's like, wait a second, you know, brother, this is supposed to be man-on-man defense. I had my daughter. You're supposed to have your son. <laughs> but luckily, we, we found him within five minutes uh, around all of that water in Venice and Murano. But, yeah, so, so yeah, it was, uh, we had stories like that uh, that we, uh, that we can uh, laugh about. And experience. Well, what's the, what's the contrast of that of you growing up in a small town, Tennessee, and your kids really yeah. growing up around the world? Yeah, I think the the contrast is uh, hopefully they uh, they have the perspective that anything is possible. Um, I think they also have the perspective, given that they had such you know like the uh, the Benetton you know <laughs> picture of friends from everywhere during that time frame that. You know, yeah. At the at the core, we're all human. I mean, it's all about uh, the relationships and and who you know, and so they are very much, you know, uh, you reach out to to other individuals, and they have a great great friend set. So, I think it does hopefully build with them a, a sense of they can connect with a lot of people because they've been in those experiences, and you know, they they don't mind traveling. I mean, it's not a you know fearful. If anything, they want to. Okay, where are we going? Where are we going to go and experience something different? So I hope that sets them up well uh, in this really ultra connected world where, you know, you're not competing just with everyone here in the U.S. You're competing now for the best minds across the globe. And so having a little sense of that, I think, hopefully prepares them uh, for the world. And then more importantly, we get to share our culture. We get to debunk myths and beliefs about us. Um, right. and, and when we're out and, and how we, we operate. And I think the beauty about traveling when you're overseas, at least during the time I was, is first and foremost, you're an American in most places. Folks, ah, you're American. It's not that you're a black American. It's like first you're an American. Hmm. And then they might say, oh, okay, well, then the cultural aspects we could see. And so that was also to a certain extent um, a little bit uplifting and freeing as well because – not only, you know, in those different countries, did that's, that's how folks viewed you, but then the expat community also, since you weren't all from Germany or, or wherever you might be, Japan, you, right. you also had that common bond of, hey, you're American. all away from home. So then the commonality is the school and the shared experience. And so we have great friends from all over. There's a couple of things I want to get into with that. The, sure. the first one, which felt heavy a couple of weeks ago, now feels less heavy given everything that's going on in, in America. But travel in the context of this COVID-19 you know, world that we're in, how is it now for you being, being someone that's been on the road, been on a plane for the majority of your, of your adult life? What's the, the travel experience for you now? And how are you feeling about yeah, being back I, on a plane again? Yeah, I mean... Um I know eventually I'm going to get back on the plane. Um, I think, um, you know, the things that are going to trigger it for me, um, I need to have some certainty that uh, the airlines have, you know, what systems are they putting in place to minimize uh, the impact? Ideally, it would be great if, uh, 
you know, uh, we have a vaccine in place, but that still could be a while. So, so I think once the, uh, the countries, the borders start opening up and, and I get some reassurance on how you can travel, you know, with being in a tube for seven or eight hours with your, your closest friends, right, right, uh, that uh, the risk of uh, getting uh, sick is minimized, then, then I'll start to travel. But, you know, it could be, you know, we're here in June. It might be toward the fall or, or the first half of next year where I think we're in a mode of really doing that uh, freely. Um, airlines like Emirates, I think they're testing people right off the bat, you know, right. to, before you get on the flight. So I, we'll have to see what the rest of the airlines do to provide that reassurance. You know, is it just going to be everyone wears a mask and the extra cleaning? So, so I think somewhere during that time frame, yeah, I'm going to get back on that flight to make the connections uh, with, with, uh, with my team. Well, uh, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people don't, don't uh, realize that as a multinational company, um, Procter & Gamble has offices in China, yeah. has offices in, in, in uh, around the world. And, and P&G was experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic exactly. long before it got to yeah, the United we, States. I mean, I, I mean, personally, we, I saw it coming, right? I mean, we, uh, my, my team in, uh, in Beijing, um, you know, had to make changes and, and really make uh, adjustments, uh, you know, January throughout. And, and so really, as I was watching that, I was already saying, okay, so the protocols, the approaches that they're taking there to uh, protect themselves, to get the systems back up, we're going to need that. So was already feeding that information into uh, my teams in, uh, in Brussels and Newcastle and in the U.S. of start preparing, you know, because what we're seeing happening in China you know, um, as much as we travel, it's, it's going to get here. So, um, do you so feel we, that, that that helped you guys be more prepared here in the U S I think it, I think it gave us uh, confidence and line of sight, how to manage through it. We already had as, as our teams in China worked through it and, and ran into systems that seemed to work. Uh, we knew what to pull from the playbook, uh, as things started to heat up first in Europe and other places. Um, and so I, it definitely cut down on the time frame to, to react and, and to really be able to maintain operations, both in our manufacturing facilities and also in our offices. And so even today, I mean, I know, I mean, you know, a lot of folks here are, are arguing over whether or not to, to wear a mask or not. It's like, you know, it's, it's really mandatory. And, and that's part of the way um, in a lot of our operations in, that are happening in, in China that folks are still operating in a normal basis is, is, you know, wearing your mask, doing some of the social distancing and, and taking uh, and the extra cleaning is, is, and enabling them to manage through it. How has P&G's business been doing during the, the whole pandemic period? Uh, listen, I mean, I think, uh, you know, during the period, um, you know, the products and things that we sell are, are absolutely essential for, for the consumer. Um, and for everyone, from to from toilet paper to, to right. dishwashing liquid. So, yeah, we've seen uh, business pick up like a lot of the consumer goods companies right. have. As folks are more at home, cooking more at home, um, and, uh, and so using more things at home. And so from that standpoint, portions of the business have been uh, very, very, very healthy. Other portions of the business you know, um, haven't uh, been as strong as folks might not shave as often or, mm. or other things. Mm. So, so, you know, you have different places that, uh, that are, are working through it, but in general, you know, the business has been good. Um, and, uh, we're there to really serve, uh, serve the needs of the consumer day in and day out with our brands. Well, it's interesting. I was talking to someone the other day and, and maybe you and I even talked about this a few weeks ago yep. that people are looking more to their trusted brands the brands the familiar brands during this uncertain time like what's the brands i grew up with yeah definitely and, and you know clearly you know we we take pride in really uh the brands that we build and, and really their connectedness with with the consumers that's part of why we've been around for for so long is really uh, making sure that we uh, to the best of our ability never break that promise on on delivering quality uh, products that really meet the consumer's needs day in and day out. And so I think in times like this, folks do reach for that certainty. Uh, if you're going to spend a dollar when you're not sure when your next one's, uh, where it's coming from, you want to have something that you really trust that's going to perform um, and to deliver what you need. Well, now, now, uh, Jerry, I'm going to, I'm a, I'm a full pivot on you. Full pivot. Because, All right. be, because as a, an innovation maestro R and D leader, um, we were going to talk about product and innovation and the future of CPG and all that stuff. But I really want to talk to you about what's happening in the world today, yep. because when we scheduled this, you know, a few weeks ago, um, 
what happened in Minneapolis with with George Floyd's murder hadn't happened. The ensuing protests around the country and the world hadn't happened. Um, we're in a much different place now. And, yep. You know, and I look at you as not only an inspiring leader and mentor, but you know, a successful African American male in the workforce that's made it up the ranks. And I'm just interested to hear a lot of your perspective on what's going on. One. Personally, for you, like, what do you what what are you feeling? What are you thinking about? What's what's going on to start with? And then, you know, the role that companies and brands um, should be playing right now uh, kicks you in the gut, right? And um, and so yeah, and so it, it brings up fear, it brings up anger, it brings up dismay, it bring, brought up a disappointment to sort of say, so in 2020, this is where we're at, right? Um, and, and, and so those were all the, the, the feelings and, uh, pieces that we were going through. It's like, you know, um, well, and even, uh, in even, uh, the, the Cooper, Cooper in, uh, New York, uh, just where, um, she just felt like, Hey, well, I could just call the police and say right, that you're right, threatening right. Central me Park, right. in Central Park and they'll believe me. And, and, uh, and so all of that just really brought to light. Um, that yeah, you know, racism and injustice is real, and um, and for Black Americans, uh, we would say yeah, it's something we've been feeling. But I think it now being captured and, and in light, I think a lot of other folks, the veil was revealed from a lot of eyes. Like, okay, this isn't just you know incidents that are happening. Um, well, we talked is, about it earlier, right? I mean, we, we 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 put out we put out a message about it that, and, and I really believe this. It feels different this time. The, the, the energy and the inertia behind it is different. Yep. And and there's a lot of elements and ingredients to it. it there's a lot of pent up frustration over the last few four years. There's a lot of obviously uh, uh, um, celebrities, athletes, influencers now speaking out in ways they hadn't before. There's the content and the video that we've seen, but just overall, the tipping point seems to have been reached and breached on this one. No, I, I agree. And I, I think the other piece, which uh, I was talking to my wife and, and to others that's hopeful is, you know, uh, it, it's the younger, it's multi-generational. It's diverse uh, crowds that are that are screaming for, for, for justice and equality and saying, this isn't right. Uh, it, it's just not, uh, you know, the African Americans and others. And so from that standpoint, as I've communicated, it's, it's hopeful. It's hopeful that we can maybe drive a systemic change because everyone's just like, you know, this is just wrong. And as Trevor Noah was saying, it, it, the contract was broken. There's a certain belief within society. If you haven't seen his piece, which talked about the contract that we all have of, okay, if I follow the guidelines and do everything, um, you know, the contract you made is be treated fairly, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all those things. But over the past six to 12 weeks, you know, the, the cumulative effect of that just says, well, no, there, there are the stacks, the cards are stacked, and that has been revealed to a broader subset, uh, which now is uh, is able to, uh, that's joining in. And, and well, I think it's sure, right. we, we talked about it that, and when you look out in, in you know, our office here at BSB and be somebody is right across the courthouse here yep. in Cincinnati. And when we see the protests out there, you see, um, White Americans, mm -hmm. Black Americans, Brown Americans. You see every every color out there. Right. You see um, every age group. You see it driven by that millennial younger age group, which is inspiring because you know that that they're the ones coming up saying like, "We don't want to live in a world like this." Yeah, you know? but they're they're more exactly, and uh, I think they you know they've had different experiences, uh, have a different perspective, and so and but I would also say don't overlook that. As I was in the crowd on Sunday, it is multi generational. I right. see folks from all over. So I think versus say things in the past where it was a small, you know, subset of folks that really pushing it, this is broad. And I think it just sort of speaks to a folks who are saying, no, we want a better world. We we the pendulum swings toward justice and we want to that's the world that we want to have. And I think it's also a counterbalance to some of the negativity and the ugliness that's uh, just been pervasive, right? right? I mean, the voices that really have been heard over the past, uh, you know, past three years uh, has had more of a, a negative piece and hasn't necessarily represented, I don't believe, the better angels and, and the majority of folks who want 
uh, you know, just want the best for their kids and want and, ex- and expect the best for everyone else. Right. And so, so once again, I think this is the point in time we got to drive change. Uh, well, what about you? Sense. I mean, Jeremy, I mean, here, I mean, this feels like almost like a, a, a I mean, a, a dumb question, but um, <laughs> have you experienced racism in your career? Sure, I, I just uh, had pinned a note for for my organization, and um, you know, I can't speak for you know, yeah, I can. I'm sure every African American um, has experienced, if not you know, direct racism, microaggressions at the mm. minimal. But I would say in most cases can point to several uh, occasions where it's just been abject uh, racism. Luckily for me, it hasn't been tragic. Uh, you know, I haven't been in a situation where, um, you know, I've had a, a risk of losing my life. But yeah, I've been, you know, um, not allowed to have service um, mm. in locations. Um, you know, yeah, I've had racial slurs hurled at me on, on country roads and, and in sports. Um, you know, and so I could go down, down the list. Right. Um, and so, so well, what, did you, um, what did you do in those situations? Well, I mean, you know, in, in some situations, uh, you know, in some of them you, you have confrontations and others, you just, uh, you don't escalate, you move on and, and say, I'm going to try and change it a different way. I think, um, some of the others you really look at taking a stand. So in one case where I was refused service, fortunately at that time frame, um, you know, we, we actually sued the, the establishment sort of says that, yeah, you have the power to sort of drive change if you really step out and go and do that and, and try to at least make an impact. Um, and so, yeah. And so fortunately, um, those have been some of the experiences. And so you persevere. And so you try to teach your kids and, uh, and others on here, are the things you need to do to, to the best of your ability to be safe, how to be safe in, in interactions if you, you get stopped, which, as I said, the talk um, right. is a, is a yeah, great I mean, example of, and it's real. I mean, it's a conversation that uh, we have with my son and daughter on, well, you know, not everybody is going to perceive you as being the, the lovely child that, that uh, you are in our eyes. That daddy loses overseas, you know. Yeah, in, in exactly, the exactly. <laughs> uh, and so... It's well, so just so everybody you knows, so you're referencing a, a, a commercial spot that yes. Procter & Gamble put out called The Talk. There's also one called The Look yep. that's out um, that actually I think they uh, PNG just reposted on Instagram. And, um, you know, th- that's a great uh, segue into what Procter & Gamble is doing, uh, Jerry, because we work with a lot of companies that have diversity as a value. I always have respected that Procter really live that diversity value yep and we traveled we got to see stuff and i think the multinational piece was a big True. part of it but how do you feel about how the company has been uh, reacting to what's going on and some of the content and messaging that png has been putting out hey listen I, i've been uh, you know I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the company taking a stand i mean caught a lot of fire in some of these right. but it was a, a, a conversation that we needed to have and we truly believe that a more inclusive world and better serving our consumers of all all creeds, all races, all all uh, ethnicities, and and what have you is is really what we're about. And and secondly, we we're at our best when we're leveraging really the power of everyone, whether it be inside the company to innovate and deliver our products uh, for the consumers, or reaching and touching every consumer. And so, with that foundation and what we believe, I mean, it's just natural that you know we want to step up and sort of. Uh, at least use our influence and and um, the equity that we have to sort of say, hey, this is what we value and we believe is right on how we want to treat each other uh, in that. And so I think this was an opportunity for us to really make a statement to really uh, showcase and at least express to others um, what are some of the other experiences out there that may not be obvious that uh, – a sub-segment our consumers are going to. And so you saw that piece, you saw, um, you know, Be Like a Girl, I mean, that we, we do all as well to go after gender bias. And so we, we want to, you know, we, we're not afraid that we want to tackle all of those issues because we think by elevating all of those, it makes it a better overall society for everyone. Um, and, and that's part of our purpose and, 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 and principles and values that we want to drive. Right, well, what I love about the the content that you're referencing the the look and the talk i mean those didn't get produced last week no i mean th- those we've were been things on that, this we've been on this journey year. Yeah. journey for for a while um on on driving um sort of the awareness uh and to have a conversation and and really with this being um such a big 
um, player from a marketing standpoint um, in the, globally. Right. Um, I think we view it as if someone's largest gonna, advertiser still, right? Yeah, largest exactly. Largest advertiser in the world. You got to take a stand and and uh, and uh, be a force for good uh, on mm-hmm. these subjects. Um, otherwise, you're, you're just really you know you're being silent, and, and therefore by being quiet, you're sort of condoning some of this. So. So I think it, it's uh, has the company come out with an internal message to, to to associates or to employees about everything that's going on. I mean, I know I'm yes. sure you did with COVID, but with Black Lives Matter and things like that, has there been? Yeah, internal- I mean, definitely, there's been internal communication. Um, been uh, it's gone out to the company, both sort of really expressing sort of the um, the empathy, the 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 disgust and, 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 and really, you know, how dismayed the company is about uh, sort of the events and uh, that happened in, in Minneapolis mm. and really reinforcing our company's values and, and what we stand for and, and actually making a statement on, you know, things that we're going to support to sort of, you know, further reduce uh, and improve uh, against sort of, you know, injustice and, and racial, div- racial discrimination. I'm proud that the company is um, is doing that and, and really taking the courageous leadership to get out and lend our voice um, uh, to that. Right. Well, I think courageous leadership is a, is a perfect phrase because that's what's needed. We've been talking about for a long time, even uh, at the onset of COVID, that now is the time for companies to really focus on brand purpose, values. It's not the time to market your products. It's time to talk about what you believe in. And then with this but what happened in Minneapolis and, and all the events that have happened afterwards, it's even more so a time for people and companies to take the stage, take the platform to say, this is who we are, this is what we believe. Yep. You know, well, now, <clears throat> Jerry, I was just going to share with you some stats that we pulled oh, wow. um, okay, from, okay. From, from, from Edelman um, reported in Adweek this week. 56% of the general population believe brands must speak out against racism because they have a moral obligation to do so. 52% of Americans believe it's because brands owe it to their employees to speak out. 50% say it's because brands need to fill the government's leadership void, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, they're saying, hey, we, you know, we want our, our, our brands to be the voice of the people. Uh, which, which, which I think is a powerful shift in how co- consumers are thinking. Forty-one percent say it's because they believe brands need to stand with consumers who feel that way. Thirty-eight percent say it's because brands need to attract and keep their customers, and if they don't, they're going to lose them. So the data is even speaking to when you think about fifty-six percent say more than half of the country says brands should speak out. Yep. Um, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. And I, I think it's been a shift. I think more and more today, uh, the consumers um, really want to associate themselves and buy the brands for something that um, speaks to their values. Right. All right. And and if you're not sort of saying something and, and, and driving their values, then they've got other options of where they want to go. And so it is a, a priority and a prerogative for, for companies to really take a stand on what they believe. Yes, we're primarily focused on delivering great products that really touch and improve the lives of consumers. But it's also important for us that the communities that our employees live in um, are thriving and healthy and safe um, and, and, and have a quality and justice and inclusion for all. And so whatever we can do to help there, you know, um, and so you see us, both our facilities, our corporate to sort of make a difference Right. Or wherever we're at, because we, we believe that's just part of our purpose. A lot of people, you know, listen or, or, or look at you and say that this, this, this small town kid got to see the world, rose up through the corporate ranks. So one of the most uh, um, powerful, inspiring, uh, talented companies on the planet, Procter & Gamble, led some of the biggest brands, biggest innovations, did it all uh, not only as a talented leader, but as an African-American male. How did you, how did you do it? Listen, I, I think, uh, you know, and it's a conversation I, I have with uh, with my son at times and my daughter. Uh, you got to persevere, right? And, and these things that uh, if they don't kill you, they make you stronger. And so you need to figure out how you're going to navigate that. And along the way, you know, build those relationships that, you know, as the old African, you know, proverb, if you want to go fast, go along. If you want to go far, you, you know, you, you go together, mm-hmm. right? And so... How are you bringing folks along that will support you and, and sort of fortify you as you get into those down times uh, to help you carry on? And so um, and so that's been a piece that has enabled me uh, to move uh, to move forward. And 
and like I said, I mean, I think um, my story, there are several uh, you know, inspiring leaders uh, that uh, at, at P&G. And so I'd say, um, you know, dream big um, and really think about how you're going to make a difference really either in transforming the work that you're doing, uh, the people around you. And, and, uh, and if you do that, um, typically you can uh, excel and, and, and really have great things. So be the best at what you do um, and make an impact. And if you can do that in everything you do, uh, I still believe um, in America that uh, you know nine out of ten times you'll be successful and, and move forward, even with uh, the extra, as I call it, the tax, the extra burden you may have. It might <laughs> right. might make you stronger. So persevere and move forward uh, would be my would be my message. I'm a I'm an optimist. Right? right? No, I love it. I, you know, Winston Churchill's words, man. Right. I, they sort of speak to me. What is it? Sort of like a you know, where you're already looking for the opportunity, right? right. And, and where you can go. You, you don't look at the situation uh, in a negative way. It's just an opportunity to excel. Right. Well, hey, my, um, that is uh, that is core to the Be Somebody DNA, resilience, perseverance. Um, resilience, you know better than anybody. You, you, you saw us when we were, um, you know, on top of the world in 2014, yeah. raising money, with growing our app, and then 2016 when I was dead broke, and I'm like, Jerry, can you please pay for that beer right there because <laughs> I don't got enough in my account for that one. Like, thank you. It's all put, put that on P and G, like business development, but and and which just really and you talk about relationships, Jerry. I mean, I I've always appreciated you, and 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 I can tell everybody when you're talking about the relationships and and going together as being core to who you are, and I know that's. Yeah, it's key, man. For me, it's it's a it's a key piece. I think, uh, you know, whether it be friends from from college and, and different walks of life, uh, those relationships are key. And so that would be the piece: reach out and and uh, you know connect. I, I think that is really the special sauce, man, is being able to connect and right. really understand each other. And uh, and if uh, you can do that, then a lot of this stuff sort of goes to the to the side. Right. So well said. Well, Herbie, I mean, we we left you out of the whole conversation here. Questions, but, Herbie. But, but, yes. Herbie, yes, Herbie. I was just sitting you. back. I mean, I was just sitting back watching you guys. I mean, obviously, there's such a there's such a great relationship that the two of you have, and uh, you know, you could you could feel it. I know everybody around me, I think, can feel it too. So it was just great watching you two go back and forth. So thanks for letting me just hang out on this side. Hey, of the thank room. you, man. Thank well, you, Herbie. Thanks. Well, man. well, well, Jerry, thanks for coming in, man. I really appreciate it. I, I really respect everything that that you stand for and everything that you're doing, and and hopefully you get to come back again. Come back hey, again. You guys will invite me again sometime. You know, uh, we'll, we'll see. Thanks, Jerry. Cash, Jerry had you beat on the miles. I know, man. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. He he, he won up me with the Lufthansa. Not only like a little bit. He had a couple hundred thousand miles. He had you too. I know. He had he had those hidden. He had yeah. those hidden. But man, it's so great listening to Jerry. Um, just being authentic, being real, talking about his experiences, and really talking about what's so relevant today. Yeah, it was so great hearing you guys connect. You know, you can tell that you've been you've been friends and and for years, and he's such a mentor of yours. Uh, so, so, Cash, from your conversation with Jerry, what was the one big thing? You know, I think the the anthem is that we're all more similar than we are different, and um, it's something that I've always believed in my core, and it's something that I really learned and and saw with my own eyes when I was traveling the world with Procter & Gamble, that's how Be Somebody came to life, no matter what corner of the world that I was in. And that opportunity to travel and see and meet all these different people from all these different cultures is what enabled me and educated me to understand that. You know, And, and when I think about what's going on today in the world, where people still have their the, the the bias, they still have their 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 prejudice, their preconceived notions, their misconceptions about others. It's often because they haven't seen enough. They haven't had the chance, maybe or the opportunity, to understand more about people from different places. And not everybody gets that opportunity to, you know, I feel very blessed. Not everybody gets that opportunity to travel the world. But what I always say is that if you can't go across the world, go across the country, right? And if you can't go across the country, go across the state. If you can't go across the state, go to a different part of your city. If you can't go to a different part of your city, go to a new part of your neighborhood that you've never been before. And if you can't do that, then walk down to the edge of your driveway and sit there and experience things from a different perspective. 
because that's the only way you start to understand people who are unlike you. That's the only way that in the process you learn that we're all more similar than we are different. That's so powerful, Cash. Thank you. Thanks, man. And thank you for listening to the Be Somebody podcast. Be sure to check out all of our episodes on BeSomebody.com or listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get yours. We out. You.